Thank you, Vice President, for setting out the European Commission's and your ideas on what is the unfinished business in the economic and monetary union. I'm pretty sure there's a few people on the panel who maybe have a few things to add. And just before I start with the questions, I will very quickly point out that you have the opportunities to send the opportunity to send me questions, which I can then pose to the panelists. And you can, of course, at the end also ask your questions in person. And also, I have a, a question up here that would be great if you could answer, because I'm very interested in also how people beyond the Brussels bubble and beyond the sort of sphere when the, where these things are discussed actually feel about how to take our monetary union forward. Um, and it looks at the level of risk sharing and financial risk sharing that we will need in the Eurozone going forward. So I'm very much looking forward to your answers. Um, to start out with, um, I would like to ask um, Peter Kazimir, um, because I think we really need to get an idea of what is the national perspective on this, because it's the member states and especially the finance ministers who are feeling the impact of the crisis. Um, in Slovakia, and for you as the minister, what has been the most annoying aspect of monetary union in the most recent years? And what would be the best way of fixing it as part of an overhaul of, of, the, of the monetary union? It's really good to pick it in. <laughs> about the annoying aspect. But <clears throat> the first of all, I would like to touch your, your remarks at the beginning because you, you complained that nothing happened over last, that was the boring year, whereas, you know, where you have been with, that, with our, colleague, uh, our Greek colleagues, so that's, that's the reason I... <laughs> but that was, in, that was until August, there have been yeah, a few so, months. Okay, so, so now we are in, in November. So, talking about the Slovak experience, you know that we joined the Eurozone on 1st January 2009. So, and from this, this currency union, has been experienced the most severe economic crisis in its history. So which in and of itself, it's quite uh, annoying, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's froze from the beginning, yeah. Uh, but we are lucky and we are quite proud. Still, we are a proud member of, of the Eurozone. And maybe somebody, remember, you can remember that it was not so difficult to become the part of uh, this club. You know, especially, especially before crisis. So, so the crisis was really for us and something like eye opener. You know, uh, for us that showing that the, the eurozone is is not so robust uh, pillar of economic stability as it's supposed to be. You know, and so as as a result of the situation for country like uh, Slovakia is. Uh, that it's a little bit unfair, be, be country, you know, like my is, which is doing, which do the fiscal and structural homework at the national level, but the responsible uh, policy ch uh, choices are not rewarded economically enough because, because uh, the real situation uh, the situation in the, in the Eurozone as a whole is trans translating and transporting uh, uh, these troubles uh, to the growth of GDP, to the problems with the labor market. So not reward, but punishment sometimes, you know. So, and and, and it's, it's also very difficult to, to find that in such situation, no. So, yes, I remember, I remember times that we were we have been penalized for the membership in, in, in this club, you know. So, so it's happened, but it's almost whole history, I hope so. Because the Eurozone, like, like uh, well, this uh, mentioned, responds uh, to these challenges. And, and this response was, uh, was uh, very useful. Um, but I think it was the crucial we have to that, that we, uh, the, the acting instead of reacting. I think this is, uh, this is, I think, it's very important to mention. So, uh, also what we, we should admit, finally, that uh, there is also the institutional problem, which is incorporated darkly in, in, uh, in this uh, currency union, 
and which is not going to, uh, which requires a systemic uh, solution. And talking about a systemic solution, so then we have to go back to the uh, economy, to academicians, and uh, you know the economic literature has been saying that it's it's quite easy. <laughs> that the <clears throat> I just will quote: uh, the currency union cannot function effectively without the fiscal union. You know, this is just this is a theory, but this is a maybe this is a reality. So. Which kind of fiscal union I mean is I mean the fiscal capacity to cushion the shocks, symmetric and asymmetric. That's that's uh, that's also easy. If you want, to, you because you call us to irritate, so I irritate. <laughs> <laughs> that's all. Thank you. Thank you. I mean that's a very interesting idea. This embrace of uh, fiscal union from a country that is usually one of the hawks, one of the strict ones, one of the ones everybody needs to be responsible for themselves. So about his view, does Austria want fiscal union? And looking back at the last few years, what has been the most annoying part of this Eurozone for, for you and your country, and how can we fix it? Thank you very much uh, to Peter for his engagement in the Eurogroup, because it's sometimes not easy to work there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> can see how this group, Eurogroup is working and we are all interested from different points of views to develop the <coughs> European Monetary Union to a better design for progress. So if I look back for my period for about 40 months uh, being Minister of Finance of Austria, but looking also back to the history, uh, from the point of Austria we can say that for Austria the membership in the European Union and in the Eurogroup is a success story. So it helped us very much in our competitiveness all over Europe, and it helped us very much the enlargement of the European Union with the neighbor states like Slovakia is one of the important ones. So something is going very well, and something. Do you have a problem? <laughs> you. <laughs> okay. Better is empty. <laughs> it works. Hopefully. So, of course, we have to do some things in another way we do it now. That's true. One of them is, as I always say in Austria, that is also for the Austrian government, not <coughs> only for the European <coughs> Union. We have sometimes problems between the competences and the responsibilities. Who has the competence and who is responsible? And it's very necessary what uh, Waldis Dombrovsky said, that the five presidents report should help us to solve this problem in the future. The second thing is um, the monetary union had brought a plenty of advantages. It's a monetary union is a good idea for a unified Europe, but it's true that uh, the community uh, and the processes and the state of work in the community can be optimized. So the second thing which is a problem for developing and finishing, not unfinishing, finishing uh, the, the EMU is the question of speed. So we are often discussing for years about a problem, but we cannot come to a result. So one of the problems is we have too much announcement and too less result. And we should change this and I hope that the five presidents report will help us also to solve <coughs> this problem. And if you look to special problems, we have done a good job and in something we have done not so a very good job. So let us speak about short, very, very quickly about Greece. There we have lessons learned. The third program has more front loading before paying the money as the first and second program, program together. We have lessons learned and that's good to do it. We have, of course, the problem that we have some, some discussions about the governments in between the institutions. So sometimes I'm really astonished if the president of the commission 
gives us some information about the media, about, for instance, deposit scheme or other things. That should be discussed in between the institutions, and therefore the governance of the institution has to be a question for the future. One thing which we can <coughs> explain, which is a problem for us, probably <coughs> also for my colleagues on the panel. While this uh, Dobrovsky spoke about a very important thing, that's the banking union. It's one of the really success things the union did. But there the first step is that we have to implement the BRRD regulative. And it is hot, has not been implemented by all the member states. Eight of the member states are lagging behind. But we are discussing about things like uh, the next pillar, like uh, deposit guarantee scheme, which is the third step before we have finished the first step. So in my opinion, we should learn lessons make the first step, then the second, and then the third, and not the third before the second and the first. That could us help to end the discussion about this probably unfinished union. Another example is bridge financing. We discuss about many, many times uh, about the bridge financing for the single resolution fund. And we have not a clear decision up now. Maybe we get it on Monday or Tuesday. That could be possible. But that are the problems we have also in the aspect of the image of the European Union, of the Commission, and of course of the Member States. What is the result? We have done probably some good things, but maybe not, not fast enough. Let us point out one of the Commission's uh, working program is BEPS. That's very important for the developing the European Monetary Union because there is the connection to the fiscal question, which is very important. And if you look how the world is changing in online business and other things, in, in special problems we have in the fiscal system, it's a good that we do this, but we have probably to, to give all these issues more speed. And we should remember, if you build a house, every brick is an important brick. But first, you need a good fundament. It's not necessary to build the chimney before the fundament. And uh, therefore, I hope that we can be as successful as we have been in the crisis. I don't know who said it, I think it was Churchill who said, never waste a good crisis, so let us learn out of this crisis. But as the member states, the European Union has probably the same problem, that we have not changed from, ad from administrating in a very good way the crisis to design the development for the future. And that's the question, if we want to be successful by deepening the European Monetary Union, by by transferring the Fives President report, we have to remember that that is necessary, that we are thinking about a vision for the future and not only administrating the status we have now. Thank you. Um, Edward Skikluna, what's the view from, from Malta? You're this small island, a little bit separate from the rest, but you've still been paying for all these bailouts and over the last few years, what has really gotten your goat? What, was the th what is the thing that you don't want to deal with ever again, and how can it be resolved? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I thank uh, the minister and, and the organizers for inviting me over here. I think it's a very, very important uh, conference. Um, I, let's take them one by one. Um, I, I think for Malta and for the Eurogroup in general, it was, has, has been a very positive experience. Um, we're, we're learning step by step. And uh, it took the, um, it was a very testing time, I must say. Um, and just like a boat and its crew will be tested during a storm, not when it's, uh, you know, very calm seas. And it was quite stormy, uh, it's agreed. I mean, we have never seen anything of this sort um, in our own lifetime. 
And um, because we recall, before the crisis, things in the European were, were becoming a bit uh, boring. Um, talking about 2010, giving lip service here and there. So actually, uh, the, the, this earthquake, this storm really shook us up and started going and thinking seriously uh, about the limitations of, 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 of the, our, our structure, how strong it is or how weak it is to withstand these types of, of, of crises and, and, and shocks. Um, I, if I were to... So, th th you know, that's, that's the positive side and we are still working progress. We, uh, we must admit there were th times where were embarrassing for us. I mean, they could have been done better and, and which experience doesn't uh, have this, these sorts of incidents. I mean, the Greek case uh, really almost got out of hand and, and it was difficult because it was also um, unprecedented. But I think looking overall, if, if there were two uh, areas where you, you could have done better um, sitting back now, um, the first one is that you would expect that since we're not going on our own, we are but a group and, and we're talking about coordination, then there should be coordination. So our response to the crisis and to the debt crisis, the debt crisis was that everybody does the same thing. And this is what was not needed. Um, it was needed from countries like Greece and, and other indebted countries, but it shouldn't have been uh, overall for everybody, because this is the kind of aggregation in economics they, they tell you about. If, if, if one thing is good, if everybody does it, it's not, it, it might not be good. <clears throat> and the fact that surplus countries um, joined in, indebted and deficit countries together and, and, and deflating, uh, so to speak, on, on, on a large scale, put us where we are now, that, that, that uh, we, we, we can't just get out of this uh, <coughs> deflation. We should have had a more, much more intelligent, and, and because the experts were telling us, they, we, if only we had our eyes open and listened, we, you know, um, <coughs> the surplus countries should have uh, looked at their own responsibility, which would have been different. But what we did were we looked at the most indebted and weak countries and continue pressing them, pressing them. But there was nothing done <coughs> to, to, uh, for those countries who could have increased demand to compensate. Uh, we must recall that, especially in the Eurogroup, we, are, we are have a fixed exchange rate. We are all in with one currency. So all the models of the IMF, which they've had, so many of them, all the crises since the Second World, you know, since the setting up of the IMF to, to, to date, were all about countries who had a, a floating exchange rate um, in, in, in the main. And, and so while they were consolidating on, on the internal side, they had an external sector which compensated, and that we were fixed. So that is uh, one area. The other one, is, and still with us, is that uh, the Eurogroup or the, uh, the European Union um, is not as good for multitasking. In other words, um, it, it, it concentrates on one issue uh, with the exclusion of the other. And, uh, you know, this happened uh, in our response to the crisis, but it's also about, for example, uh, the taxation methods. They are very important. Tax evasion, tax avoidance is the time and, and so on. And uh, we're all for, uh, it, it, we know that it will improve the, the exchange of information, would help also the monetary union itself. But not to the exclusion of other things. They should have been in parallel and not, you know, all the competitiveness issue where we're paying lip service and we're off our radar screen. So most of our energy, and correctly, was about banking regulation and, 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 and financial regulation, and then coming up and topping it with the banking union, which I agree with my colleagues that it was a success, and, and we just hope, uh, as, as it has been done in our country, we've, we've passed all the legislation regarding the BIRD, and the IGA will be uh, approved uh, in, in, a, in a week's time. So uh, I just wish my colleagues would join and, and, and make sure that by the 1st of January all, all, all the countries will have the legislation in place because this is very essential. We've been successful and therefore we want to uh, at least complete a very big but successful project and, and bring it uh, to, to its uh, 
imp implementation. But going back to the competitive, uh, competitiveness issues are now being discussed now. Uh, I mean, we're, we're about seven, eight years, you know, uh, after the crisis, and and this was our weakness. I mean, uh, the European Union and the and, and, and the Eurogroup in the international uh, arena uh, is 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 telling, and 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 it is now that we are and we will support, you know, competitiveness authority. The fact that the, that the, our own fiscal councils will be li like internal auditors with the fiscal board being the external auditor. That, this is something which is very, very important. It will strengthen as a minister, the, each national minister's hand in controlling expenditure and keeping to the targets of the deficit. But uh, overall, there are, were a lot of positive things. The country-specific recommendations, at least in our case, were just on the dot. The, these were the kind of agenda any government should have taken, and it was very comforting to see that the Commission was seeing the same view of where our strengths and weaknesses are. So, overall, um, we've learned a few lessons. Um, we're, the worst is behind us. And uh, we should now build um, on, these, on, these, uh, on these experiences and concentrate on competitiveness. You know, we cannot delay uh, this such an important uh, topic because we're always repairing, repairing here and patching there. But overall, are we in a good, strong position to race with other regions, with other blocks, and come at the, to the front as we deserve? Well, we've got a long uh, track um, to go there. Um, Guntram, you're actually German, but you've, I think you've been in Brussels for long enough to take sort of the, the, the few from the top and tell us what is the one thing that has really annoyed you in the last few years? And what is the one that policymakers, the people up here on the panel who are taking decisions, on our monetary union, what is the one thing that they should really focus on now and get done? Well, thank you very much, uh, first of all, for, for this question. I mean, of course, for, for me as, a, as an economist and a think tanker, um, we are having a good crisis because whenever there's crisis, uh, there's demand for, for expertise. So, uh, so in that sense, I'm not unhappy about it, but of course, <laughs> uh, of course I'm unhappy about, uh, uh, let me say, really three things. Uh, the first one is that uh, GDP performance of the euro area is about as bad as it was during the Great Depression. Um, and uh, I think this is, this is not a very good benchmark against which we, we, we are measuring ourselves. Um, so certainly a uh, need for improvement. I'm also not happy about uh, youth unemployment um, in the south of Europe. Uh, I think it is at unacceptable high levels. And let me also quite frankly say, um, when you go to, uh, to Asia, um, and you know that Asians are very polite, and you know, if, if an Asian friend tells me, when will you Europeans finally get your act together, um, you sort of feel that um, also the rest of the world sort of wants the Eurozone really to, uh, to move and to succeed. Now, my take is that um, uh, the Eurozone is not in equilibrium. We are unbalanced. Um, and you know, one of the things you learn when, uh, when you go to graduate school, it's, it's called Walras Law. Yeah? So Walras, um, a theoretician, um, it's the foundation of neoclassical economics. I mean, what he basically says is if one market is not in equilibrium, then there must be another market that is also not in equilibrium. And I think that's why we should be uh, extremely cautious thinking that the disequilibrium that we're observing in the south of Europe just concerns the south of Europe. It does concern also the north of Europe. So I think the imbalance in one part of the Eurozone is also an imbalance in the other part of the, of the Eurozone, especially in the north. And uh, I think you, you've talked about uh, this, uh, uh, Edward. I mean, there, there is certainly the, uh, the issue of um, uh, adjustment in the south, and there is the issue of adjustment in the north. And uh, I think we should not belittle, belittle that, that problem. It is about... Um, uh, demand. It is about uh, wage developments. Wage developments have been far out of line uh, compared to productivity in the south of Europe in one direction, but they have been far out of line in the north of Europe in the other direction. And I think this is this is um, the fundamental problem. And 
that needs to be fixed, and it's not an easy thing to fix. Um, now, let me quickly quickly uh, go through, go uh, go on on two other points um, that that I think de deserve attention. I mean, one is of course this whole discussion on, on banking union. I think banking union is of course a key a key project. Um, uh, we at Bruegel have been uh, promoting and emphasizing the importance of that project. Uh, um, throughout the years, as early as uh, as back in 2007, some in independent ec economists even emphasized this before the euro was founded. Now, I think we should be aware that at the moment it's not finished, yeah, and that's why uh, I, I I think it's a good thing that the European Commission tries to to continue uh, uh, pushing that agenda. But of course, that agenda is an agenda that has to do uh, not just about risk sharing, but also about risk reduction. And I think that's um, uh, certainly uh, um, correct. I mean, we cannot have a banking union where um, you know, basically the link between banks and governments is only uh, um, cut uh, through a sharing of risks on the liability side. I think we, at, uh, simultaneously, we'll, we will have to make sure that, become, that banks in their asset side become more European, meaning they should have hold less sovereign debt um, of the country in which um, they are located, which probably means introducing single exposure rules and ensuring that um, uh, uh, banks in other countries um, are actually ready and allowed to buy sovereign debt from from banks uh, in uh, in uh, from from governments uh, of other countries. Now, last point uh, is is still this this um, uh, structural structural reform discussion, competitiveness discussion. I mean, I totally think that we we need to we need to take uh, we need to take a, a global view on this. I mean, we uh, we are certainly. Uh, not performing as well as we want. It is not uh, a, a reason to be happy if uh, Greece um, improves from number 70 to number 60 on the global rankings uh, of competitiveness. It's still not enough. I mean, we need to, if we want to have our living standards, we have to become better in, in what we are doing. Um, we have to improve our education systems. We have to <coughs> have better administration, less corruption, and so on. <coughs> so I totally am on the side of those demanding uh, uh, a very deep, uh, deep structural reforms in the countries that, that perform worst on those corruption governance uh, indicators and so on. This, this is really uh, an agenda for the future. Thank you. So not one easy, quick fix. <laughs> not surprising, I guess. Um, it seems to me that in, in these presentations and also yesterday from um, the Eurogroup president, there, there was some criticism of the European Commission. Um, Hans-Jörg Schelling just mentioned that actually maybe we're moving a little bit too fast on the deposit guarantee scheme. Maybe we need to implement the second leg like BRD, which is... Um, which, which allows uh, the, the investors in banks to, to, or forces the investors in banks rather to absorb losses first before governments come in and actually put money into these banks. That that needs to be completed first. Then the Eurogroup president said yesterday that the, the, fis the, the European Fiscal Board that the European Commission just proposed a few weeks ago actually falls quite a bit short from um, from what had been in the five presidents' reports, maybe it should be given more power and more, more more rights to assess national budgets. And then, of course, the Maltese finance minister just pointed out that actually, maybe we need to be looking at the economic policies of different member states in the aggregate, that not everybody cuts spending at the same time, which could be one of the things that this fiscal board could do. Um, so, Vice President Dombrovskis. Is, is, is the European Commission maybe mo moving too fast without too much, without enough coordination with the member states? Or are you in fact doing w w what we've just heard from, from Mr. Schelling, that in fact we need to move fast and always talking, talking, talking is actually just holding us back? Uh, well, uh, I would say on uh, uh, those issues as regards uh, economic governance, uh, it's uh, extremely uh, difficult to find a consensus. Uh, for uh, some countries, uh, European Commission is a ruthless enforcer of austerity. And we heard some 
views on this. For some other countries, we are far too generous in applying the rules. We are not strict enough, we are not credible enough in enforcing stability and growth pact. Uh, same uh, with the uh, proposals on uh, deepening of uh, EMU. Uh, some countries are saying it's all too little, too late. We must actually move right away to stage two in five presidents' report and, uh, and, and be much more ambitious. Some are saying, let's take a break, let's implement what we have decided in recent years, and we'll take a look. Uh, uh, and so uh, we are trying to find a, a balance between those different opinions, and uh, it's clearly that will not be universally uh, applauded, because uh, uh, there are very divergent views uh, uh, among uh, member states, so how quickly on which items we should uh, move. Uh, but then on some specific elements you raised, uh, for example, on uh, European Deposit Insurance Scheme, uh, this is exactly what I outlined also in the introductory remarks, that completing the banking union first means that we need to uh, uh, fi uh, finish what we have started, including full uh, transposition of uh, uh, BRRD, uh, including full implementation of uh, Deposit Guarantee Schemes uh, Directive, uh, including ensuring uh, bridge financing for a single resolution fund. Uh, if we are to successfully move also uh, towards European deposit insurance uh, scheme. And uh, of course, all those issues are, are very much linked and also mm -hmm. European uh, deposit insurance scheme, which is uh, basically as element of risk sharing, uh, also should be accompanied with a further work in terms of risk reducing, in terms of macroprudential uh, frameworks, so on risk exposures, uh, and, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, there we need uh, to move on uh, parallel on uh, 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 in uh, both those uh, uh, directions. So and you can use other examples in uh, uh, in uh, uh, other uh, areas uh, uh, that it's not so easy to find a uh, consensus because opinions vary quite uh, dramatically among uh, member states. So what has been outlined in a five presidents report that it has an ambitious yet uh, realistic approach. And that's more or less what we are following to, uh, through also in our uh, proposals. Uh, Mr. Kazimir, I think by calling for fiscal union, you are maybe, if you just look at the stages in the five presidents' reports, skipping ahead quite a bit. And just to draw in a few questions from the audience, what exactly do you have in mind when you think of fiscal union? I mean, we've, we've spoken in the past about having yeah. small incentives for structural reforms. We've spoken about a full budget. We've spoken about an unemployment fund. What do you have in mind? What, what kind of fiscal union for the Eurozone? Definitely, we are not spoken about the Minister of Finance, because, you know, sometimes we are just beginning from the, the structure, who will be sitting where. But, but you, you were surprised with that, that how, how can a so hawkish country with the hawkish Minister of Finance be committed to the fiscal union? Just to explain, we are hawkish, to the, but related to the, uh, to the rules, you know. And honestly, uh, I do believe in, in the federal future of, of the Europe, and, and that's all, despite of what, what uh, Mr. Vice President described as how it's, how it's difficult to communicate inside of, of Europe. Sometimes we are Italian family, that's, that's true. So this is a, this is a r reality. And uh, talking about the timing, you know, it's also important. I, I can imagine under different scenario in August with, uh, with, with Greece, that we are in, in integration, we are speedy Gonzalez, you know, now. <laughs> so, because this, this could be a completely different situation in different environment. But this is history now, and the reality is that we have to be cautious and we have to really to focus on, on the work which has been already done. I do agree with Hans Jörg on, on this, for example, on, on this um, bridge financing. I mean, bridge financing of resolution fund, and and I'm really angry with with uh, certain colleagues because uh, you know you are in a country where the BRD was uh, uh, fully integrated uh, in the legislation, 
uh, EGA ratified. We, we are a country with ex ante deposit scheme fund. We are a country with, um, with real uh, resolution, national uh, resolution fund, I mean, as a, as a backstop, I mean, real money, not just uh, leveraging or something uh, virtual. So, so it's, it's quite difficult to explain to, uh, to people in this country that there are others, you know, where, where they don't have even this uh, ex ante fund, so with, with empty packets. No, so this is, uh, this is uh, difficult. So the first of all, homework, do your homework, and later on we can uh, to finish uh, uh, this, uh, this case on, on the deposit scheme, for example. And talk about the, uh, the fiscal uh, union. So I really, I, I don't think that the Eurozone can work in, on, in its present form in the long term. And uh, Okay, what we need is the creation of country, country cyclical buffer, which would effectively administer temporary fiscal transfers to, to cushion macroeconomic shocks. Well, what does it mean? In, in such instrument can take a form of common European unemployment insurance scheme, for example. Uh, Pierre Carlo Paduan raised this issue uh, during the Italian presidency, during the informal ECOFI. This is a quite realistic uh, plan. And could be understandable to Europeans because this is a really crucial because it's a sensitive issue, the redistribution uh, to transfers between between countries. But I think it could be quite visible and, and uh, understandable to the people. This is a crucial. So this is a this is a, just a, a example. And talking about the uh, uh, symmetric shocks, so then it's we, we almost have it. So it's this this FC. So it could be the, the permanent FC. So this is uh, just about the, this could be the vision, you know. And, and okay, uh, we need to be pragmatic. Uh, Rome also was not built uh, in a day. Uh, this timing, I know that it's, I think it's, it's, it's the right time to irritate us, which, which the role of the commission, for example, which is the role is coming with uh, the Commission is coming with uh, very enthusiastic uh, plans. So I think this is a uh, good work has been done on this issue. Mr. Schelling, coming from one of the countries with the lowest unemployment rates in, in the Eurozone, do you think your citizens, understanding where, very well what it means to pay into a common unemployment fund, would be happy to do so and, and support a country like Spain, where unemployment is above 20%, or like Greece? Well, no, they don't. We'll understand. So it's not explainable in a straight way. You have to give another way of explanation if it is necessary. The second thing is there was no critics at the Commission. I think that the Commission makes a very good job. The problem is that most of the member states don't understand that we are Europe. We are part of Europe. And as uh, Vice President Dombrovskis said, we have so different meanings and positions where we can find no consensus. It's always the same way. The member states cannot find a consensus and, and the, 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 the Commission has made it in the wrong way. So that's always the same discussion. Let me make it clear, it's not in this way. We are Europe, we are member states and we have to bring in our positions. And most of the content the Commission brought in the last year, since the new Commission is established, were very, very good. Look at the banking union, look at the, at the discussion about the capital union, look about the five presidents report. That's the right way where we can bring together a better result than we have it now. The second thing, what is probably have to be done is how we can find a better economic coordination for that what you said, how we can raise the GDP. That's very important for Europe because let me point out just three figures. Europe has 7% of all inhabitants of the world. Of all people of the world are 7% from Europe going down because other countries have a better reproduction rate, as it though. The second figure is 25% of the worldwide GDP is run by Europe, going down. But 50% of all spending of the social systems are done by the Europeans. 
is that a model which we can finance at, for a long time? Or have you think about other things? So therefore, it's very important that if you have a discussion about probably the G7, G7 or G20, what is the role of Europe? Not what is the role of a very strong economic country like Germany. What is the role of Europe generating growth in the Euro area and in the world? Because we need this to solve some problems. So the unemployment rate in Austria, it was your question, it's going up. Uh, one of the problems is that Austria is a growing country. We have about 8.3 million inhabitants and we are growing up to probably 9 million. Uh, we are, have a long, long tradition as a country for immigration. And the problem we have solved is the same as, uh, as uh, Peter said and Wally said. This problem can, also, can only be solved if you make structural reform in all the systems. And we have to do this and we have to do our homework in every member country. Not, it's not the, not the responsibility of the Commission. But what we also have to discuss is that we have an all-time high of employees. All-time high of employees. So what we are doing now is we try to find uh, a way back to the growth. We had have 0.4 in the last in the year 2014, we will have about 0.7 in the year 2015, and we will double it in the next year. That's the good message. We double it in the next year. Just the Commission told us 1.5. Thank you. <laughs> good message for us. But it's, we have so many problems in every member state, solving unemployment, generating growth, and so on that it's not easy to explain to the Austrian people why we should make a deposit guarantee scheme, why we should make a European-wide unemployment insurance, uh, because the people say we have enough problems in our own country. And that's a very, very big problem to find the balance between the solidarity of union, Europe, where we are a member, and the national point of view which is political, very difficult to explain. Not so probably in the, in the, in the content or, the, or about the issues, but it's political, a very big problem. It's a problem in between a coalition and it's a problem with the opposition. Pesty opposition. <laughs> um, Mr. Skikluna, so you said earlier that um, we should, there should be more focus on the aggregate stance of uh, Eurozone economic policies. But that also means for, for some governments to lose some of their sovereignty. What if you, as a, as a country, f actually feel right now is the right moment for you to cut spending because you know that you actually have um, some pension bills coming up in the future or vice versa? Would you be willing to give up this sovereignty? What, and what does it mean? Does it mean having a European Fiscal Council? Does it mean having a European Finance Ministry? Does it mean the Eurogroup President? I mean, who gets to take the decision on that? Well, definitely the question of sovereignty is a, it's a political question. It's a, it belongs to the electorate, as, as my colleague was saying. I mean, they have to decide what they are ready to give up in order to obtain, even in the country itself. When we give up, you know, when we elect a government, we give up certain freedoms in order to obtain something in return. The same for taxation, we pay in order to get uh, collective services. So, however, before um, I answer this question, I, mean, I, I think uh, I'd rather like to see how are we going to be judged by our children in the future? Would they, have we made a good job? I mean, have we achieved what we intended to achieve? They're not going to lose uh, themselves into this legislation and the other one, and how many nights we've been uh, kept awake in order, you know, to, to uh, and, and the media circus and so on. I mean, we're going to be judged. Where are we? And, and I, I, I definitely agree with, with, with Guntram here that finally, what we would like would be that the European Union, especially the Eurogroup, will be at the top as far as the competitiveness report, whether it's the World Economic Forum or the uh, World Bank's uh, doing business. 
one would like that the best countries will be at the top and, and, and would want to see um, our own union being there together, um, where at the moment uh, we are not. So th these indices, by the way, whether undertaken by these institutions or by Bruegel uh, in the sense of, of, of advising, um, have been very scientific.